Welcome back to GB News. You're watching The Camilla Tomini Show. Lovely to have your company this Sunday morning. I'm delighted to be joined now by former Chancellor of the Exchequer and MP for Spelthorne, Kwasi Kwarteng. Lovely Hello. to see you this Very morning. Good to see you. Always good to see you. Why weren't you in the budget then? Why well, weren't you watching? It. I was oh. watching it uh, from my office. Right. And the reason I'm not in the chamber is that, um, you know, people, I don't want to sort of people to pick up my reactions to certain Fair measures. Fair enough. There's so, a suggestion uh, you and Liz Truss were running scared. Uh, no, no, I was scared of what? I don't <laughs> I don't understand. Know. <laughs> Your own economic principles being <laughs> sacrificed on the altar of a what I thought was a very labour light budget. Well, it was a very centrist and very careful budget. Yeah, the right budget sure. for now? Well, it, it's odd that um, having seen the budget, the polls don't seem to have moved at all. No. Um, and I think there's going to have to be something different uh, in the run up to an election, which is not going to take place in May. I think the idea that you know, if we're 28, 25 points behind us, according to some polls, mm. that we're going to press the trigger on a general election. You think that's think for the birds? Bit, I, I, I don't believe that for So a what minute. do you think? There's going to be another fiscal event before I don't know. the election? I, I'm I mean... not quite sure. It depends all about the timing. Obviously, if it's in May, this will be the last fiscal event and the election will have to be called in two weeks. I can't see that happening. I mean, it's a fiscal fizzle out, isn't it? We were waiting. I mean, I don't know if you, like me, were sort of watching and he said, OK, so I'm now going to raise the VAT registration threshold for businesses. Mm. And I thought, my goodness, he's going to do something radical. He's going to raise it to 150 grand. No, it's to by, 90. By five grand. That's right. Oh. And then he goes, and we're all being doubly taxed because we're paying income tax and national insurance. So, and I thought, my God, he's going to scrap national insurance. Oh, no. Well, I don't think he's going to do bold measures. I mean, the way but, I've, but, I've been on the inside, a lot of this will be driven by officials, let's face it. Mm. And the officials will be the people who will be there regardless of what happens in the general election. So... Well, but then that brings me back, actually, to one of the people's panellists asking, I mean, is the officialdom, is the Treasury just acting against anyone that's Chancellor that wants to be doing <laughs> so, something radical? The question was, do you think that the deep state acted to get rid of you? So I'm not this? a deep state conspiracy no. theory right. guy. I mean, I'm a historian, so generally I believe in cock-up, not conspiracy. Fair play. Um, but I think, you know, that doesn't mean that people weren't acting against uh, what the government was trying to do. I don't think it was particularly coordinated. But there is resistance. There's often resistance to things um, that the government is proposing. But that's the job of the ministers, to bring people along with, uh, with them. I mean, when I was Bay Secretary of State, I worked very well with officials yeah. uh, because we had a clear uh, set of, of purposes. How about the role of the Office for Budget Responsibility in all this? Because obviously that body was set up to sort of act as a check and balance mm. to a budget that might go slightly off the rails. To be fair, you didn't consult the OBR and that might have no. been why your budget went off the rails. Sure. But are the OBR now um, sort of having far too much influence on the contents of the budget? So I think they're a very powerful organisation. And the reason why they're more powerful now is that we tried to cut them out. Liz Truss and mm. I tried to cut them out. Why did you decide to do um, that? I think the feeling was that we just wanted to get on uh, with things. I think the Prime Minister was very keen uh, to, to press her programme. And she knew that if she went through the OBR, um, a lot of the things she wanted to achieve uh, would have been prevented, essentially. Yeah. So you, th but there's an agreement that the OBR has become all too powerful. It's very powerful. I mean, there's no question that... Too powerful. Um, it's, it's a, it, it really constrains what, what chances can do. But are do. you saying too powerful? Um, I'm saying that I think it's, it's got way too much um, uh, force uh, and, and I can understand why chances and the, the civil service mm. look to the OBR. But the other thing about the OBR is that its predictions are almost always wrong. And I was very clear when I said this to the Prime Minister at the time that their 72 billion black hole that they, they predicted, I said by the new year that would close because yeah. inflation was high and that meant fiscal drag would mean that taxes were going to, um, were to, go, to go up, as, as is exactly what happened. I mean, so also, the black hole wasn't nearly as big as um, uh, they suggested. On fiscal drag... Um, shouldn't he have unfrozen the thresholds? Because when we did all of our calculations for The Telegraph, you can put your earnings into a tool and find out if you're more well-off or better better off or less well-off in five years' time. Everyone's less well-off because of the freezing of the so, tax And that's where the ABR's numbers are really important, because if he were to um, lift the thresholds, according to the ABR's arithmetic, he'd have to raise money in, in other areas to make mm. the thing balance. And that's why uh, it's very difficult uh, with the ABR uh, to, to reduce taxes, because essentially they force you, if you're going to reduce taxes, they force you to either um, you know, raise taxes elsewhere or borrow the money, which creates its own problems. I mean, on, on another level, isn't it a good idea for them to have shot Labour's foxes when it came to, say, the scrapping of non-DOM um, and I some of the other measures? Well, uh, the, the problem with that, I mean, it sounds clever and it's triangulation, you know, the sort of thing we saw 20 years ago, but a risk of that 
is that if you're essentially taking Labour policies, you're endorsing Labour. Yeah. And the, uh, the electorate will say, well, you're doing Labour policies anyway. Why don't we, vote, why don't we just yeah. vote for Labour? Yeah. Um, so that's do you think problem. they should have been a bit more reformish? Well, look, I think, uh, and, and actually Michael was here early, Michael Portillo, and he used to have a phrase, which I remember from back in the day, clear blue water, you want some yes. distinction yeah. between what you're offering and what the opposition is offering. If you're essentially doing the, a pale imitation of what they, they want to do, um, you're essentially endorsing their platform. Mm. And people will ask themselves, well, why don't we just vote for Labour? Well, talk about clear blue water between Starmer and the Tories. Is the answer to that question to bring back Boris? Look, I think I've said here on this show yes. uh, that Boris is arguably, well, no, not arguably, I think incontestably, the best uh, campaigner in the party has. He's won more elections than anyone else in the party, certainly more than the current prime minister. And he'd be a great force uh, for the party. But that's a question for the party leaders yeah. and for I mean, Boris. I'm not sure that Boris himself well, <clears throat> particularly... I, I think last time you were here, you were sort of saying that Rishi needed to swallow his pride and give Boris a call because there'd been the suggestion from Boris's people that he would accept a call but not make a call. I've written yesterday in The Telegraph, which you may or may not have read this... I did read. ...this, this piece about the Henley plot That's and the right. idea that he's installed a close friend, Caroline Newton, to be the... Parliamentary Does she know about the plot? Candidate. Well, I think she <laughs> might be aware of it because she did comment on the possibility okay. of a Boris comeback last year. Um, so he needs to be elected, doesn't he, as an MP yeah, in order look, to I do think, this? I think could he, he lead the party again, do you think? So, so I certainly think he could lead the party again after the election at right. some point. Yeah. I would never rule him out. People have mm. done that all the time and they've generally had egg on their face. Um, but I think that for this election, it's very unlikely, firstly, that he'll be a candidate. And secondly, that I, I don't think he'll, he'll necessarily be that enthused mm. about campaigning for people who he feels were the ones who got rid of him. Do you see David Cameron as a competitor? Nobody's talking about Cameron. They're talking about Penny Morden and Kemi Badnock and So Suella. a couple of things have to happen for David Cameron uh, to get back. Uh, he has to essentially renounce his peerage, which he might do, and then get back into the Commons and he'll have to find a seat. Mm. Um, but, you know... the. If we look at the last eight years, nothing is impossible. I mean, all no. sorts of things have happened. So we could we be facing thought. some kind of Boris Cameron well... redux. Imagine, <laughs> that will be like deja vu, honestly. Um, I'm not sure how likely that is, but, um, I, but, but anything is possible. You had a reaction to the Tugendat and Trevelyan intervention on defence spending. They've said to the Chancellor that they think that the Chancellor should have earmarked more money. What do you think of I that? I think it's very bizarre about that. I mean, I'm, I'm with everything Michael Portillo said, I agree with. We've got to get away from this idea that we just, you know, by spending money, everything's yeah. going to be solved. We've got to look at how the money is spent. I think that's really important. I was surprised to see ministers, serving government ministers, bound by collective responsibility, mm. essentially freelance and write their own article. <laughs> well, I mean, saying, there's nothing new there, isn't there? I mean, <laughs> well, no, it's, that's pretty bold. I mean, you'd have to go back a long yeah. way to see something as what, blatant as that. do you think they're being that. disloyal to Rishi Sudak? Well, I, you know, I've never heard of a situation where... I mean, backbenchers, that's fine. Backbenchers are not part of the government. Yes. But actual serving ministers saying... You know, I know, but maybe they're that the worried. Chances. They're that worried um, about the threat from China, Russia and beyond. No, that's fair enough. But generally, in the old days, mm. we would, you'd, you would voice those concerns behind closed doors. Yeah. You'd speak to the Chancellor. But maybe uh, they've then, spoken to the Chancellor and they're then, getting nowhere. But the idea that you just write in the, in the newspaper or on, on yeah. social media, um, I think, is a new development. Should we talk about Michael O'Leary's intervention, the Ryan yes. Air Best, talking about Brexit, saying it was the dumbest effing idea in history delivered by the dumbest politicians in history, Farage and Johnson, and basically saying we need to wait for the over-70s to die out, which is, quotes a good thing, because younger people will change things. I find that pretty extraordinary. I mean, as Michael said, Michael Portillo, I mean, a lot of his clients, his customers, are older people. Yeah, it's a two-fingered salute yeah, to his he, own he, he doesn't understand what... I mean, he's a businessman. He doesn't really understand about dem democracy or care about sovereignty or any of the issues, really, in Brexit. Mm. Um, I mean, I understand where he's coming from, from a very narrow perspective. But actually, as Michael Portillo said, uh, it's not just about his uh, his company. Brexit's a much wider mm. uh, question about sovereignty, about uh, legal... I mean, economically, you voted to leave. Mm -hmm. um, lots of debate over whether Brexit has been economically yeah. calamitous, whether COVID's been more calamitous. I mean, what's your take on it? So, look, the thing I don't understand is the fact that Germany and France yeah. are essentially in recession. Their economies are doing... They're not doing better than ours. They're doing worse, if anything, particularly Germany. So the idea that... And these are the two biggest economies by far mm. in the EU. So the idea that if we'd stayed, we'd somehow be doing much better yes. seems bizarre to me, given that the two biggest economies in the EU are doing worse than we are at the moment. 
I've never really understood that argument. I think there's a lot of sentiment, a lot of emotion, and I understand that. But, I, but practically, when you look at the German economy where it is now, and you look at the French economy, yeah. and you look at the Eurozone as a whole, it's all as if they're growing at 5% and we are where we are. Yes. They're basically doing the same or worse. No. So I don't understand how staying in it would have in, improved our performance. Kwasi Kwarteng, thank you very much indeed for joining me this morning. Great analysis of the budget on Wednesday. Now